Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Um, it's good to be back with you. We're going to uh, join together in worship. Welcome as well if you're watching us on the video. Uh, we're going to sing All Creatures of Our God and King. So let's stand if we're able while we worship.
as we come to pray this morning. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 57. It's a really interesting psalm because it really varies. It's uh, really mountains and valleys uh, as you listen to these words. So it's Psalm 57. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp words. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let us pray. And uh, part of our prayers this morning, we're going to pray for the persecuted church. And I'm going to use a, a prayer that I saw this morning in one of their, uh, in a little devotional book. So let's pray. Father God, we join there with the words of, uh, of David. Um, there are so many words, Lord, there of wonderful praise. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. Great is your love. Be exalted, O Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And our Father, as we meet together this morning, that would be our desire, that you will be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Your glory might be over all the earth, including here. Lord, that we might lift our voices in praise and in worship. Lord, that we might be able to say, uh, along with David, that your love is great. Father, you are so good. And yet, Lord, those words are interspersed with words of David, which show the trouble he was facing. He speaks about being in the midst of lions. He speaks about spreading a net for his feet, digging a pit for his path. And Lord, those words show us that even though we may go through dark and difficult times ourselves, it is not only possible, but we will know, and can know, your presence and your protection. And Lord, we see there when, when we can join in and say, my heart is steadfast. Lord, give us steadfast and loving hearts that whatever we face, we might know your great love which reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness which reaches to the skies. Lord, we pray for those that we know, maybe even ourselves, who need to hear those words of comfort this morning. We pray for the sick, for the lonely, those who are crushed in spirit, those where life is placing a great toll on people. And Lord, we pray for other believers, especially this morning we pray for those in what we call the persecuted church. And we join in this prayer, Heavenly Father, on this Lord's Day, we think of those who meet for worship, knowing that they may face imminent violent attack. We consider those who cannot meet because their faith must remain hidden or because their churches have been closed down. We think also of those who meet in secret, not knowing whether this might be the last Sunday before they are discovered. For all such, we pray that you will send blessing, comfort and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
causing them to place their hope and confidence in the one who has overcome the world. Lord, this and all our prayers we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing two songs. We're going to sing When the Music Fades. We sang it a couple of weeks ago. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, which is all about you. And then we're going to go on to the goodness of Jesus.
our Bible reading this morning is going to be brought to us by John and um, it's from Philippians and chapter 3. Our reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Did no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evil doers, the mutilated of the flesh. For is it we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by the Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh? Do I myself have reason for such confidence? If someone thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for seal, persecuting the church, for the righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What it more, I consider everything a loss because of the surprising worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just uh, pray. Um, let's give thanks for the offering. Um, Lord, we thank you this morning that we've been able to bring an offering to you. Um, Lord, whether it's been placed in a basket in uh, cash, terms or whether it's been sent to the bank directly lord we thank you that we have the opportunity to give to you we pray that you will take every gift and use them lord that your glory might grow that your kingdom might grow and that others might come to know jesus also pray lord for the young people of our church we know lord there aren't many with us today but we think about the, uh, those in our youth club as they have their half term. We pray that you will uh, be with them, Lord. Keep them safe. Uh, keep them away from wrong influences. Keep them close to yourself. And also we pray for those who are going to go out this morning that they might learn from you whatever you would say. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to look at the word of the Lord in a minute but first of all we're going to sing now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices
I first left school and went to work, I worked as an office junior in a, a factory in the accounts department. And I had to go to college and I had to learn double entry bookkeeping. And I absolutely loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. Anything to do with numbers. And of course, it was pre computerization. It's so easy now. You just get onto uh, Microsoft Excel and put some figures in and it adds it up for you. But this was all hand done. And I loved it. I had to learn how to do a profit and loss account and a balance sheet. And your balance sheet, you list your assets with the value of them and you list your liabilities with the value of them and you take one from the other and hopefully you get net assets. Of course, sometimes you get net liabilities when what you owe is greater than what you have. But the aim always, of course, was that the assets should outnumber the liabilities. And we're going to look this morning at a Bible passage that's got accounting in it, really. And we're almost looking at a balance sheet. We hope you'll stay with me on this. If you're one of those kind of person who numbers you really don't like and you just switch off, then please don't, because it's not all going to be accounting, I promise you. But that is the background. I need to tell you that, because that is the background to what Paul is writing, really. Because Paul has an aim in life. He wants to come before God where his assets are greater than his liabilities. He wants to be righteous before God. That means he wants to be right before God. And surely that's what we want, isn't it? We want to be right before God. We want to be righteous. And we're going to see how in the past, Paul made this great bookkeeping error. Now, you see, the thing is that the important thing that you must value the assets correctly. Let me give you an example. If you owe the bank £1,000 and your assets are worth £500, but you say, no, they're not, they're worth £2,000 on paper, you might say, I've got net assets. But the truth is that you're only fooling yourself. If you overvalue them, they mean nothing, particularly if your assets aren't worth anything at all. And we're going to see how Paul has what he thought were precious, valuable assets, but not only are they not worth anything, they're actually liabilities. And we're going to see that this morning. And we've only got two main points this morning. You might be shocked. We haven't got three points. We've got two main points that are a bit longer than three points, okay? So the first thing we're going to see is Paul says, danger, take care. Danger, take care. We're just going to work through uh, what John read to us this morning. And the first word was further. But actually, if you look at older translations, you will find it starts finally. Finally, that one word a preacher might say that you doubt, okay? If we look in verse chapter 4 and verse 8, we do see in this translation, finally, brothers and sisters, and he is bringing things there to a close. But now what he wants to do is to tackle a very important danger, what these people are going to face, and that's confidence in the flesh. And he starts quite interestingly with this. Rejoice in the Lord. I think it's the Amplified Bible that says, let him be the one who makes you happy. The one that you trust in. The one that you rely on. Because Paul seems, it's, it's quite unusual, you might think, that he starts like that, because Paul seems to be angry 
And I love the way that John read it for us. And he really emphasised that. Verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. That's the same group of people, it's not three groups of people. And Jews at that time would call Gentiles, non-Jews, dogs. But Paul turns it on its head and he says, watch out for those dogs. Watch out for them. The problem is that they were teaching what we might call Jesus plus. Okay? Jesus plus. So, in other words, Jesus in himself is not enough to be saved completely. That on top of that, you still need to keep the law of Moses. That is a condition, they would have said, of being saved. And in particular, they were saying that the men needed to be circumcised. And Paul said, no, we are the circumcision. Now, not to get off the, the path this morning, because we could go a long way off this morning. He was speaking about a spiritual circumcision in the Lord Jesus Christ. So while they are saying, you need to add all these things, Paul gives a simple and straightforward description of a Christian. Simple and straightforward. In verse 3, he says, It is we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, in what we can do. You see, to worship by the Spirit of God. There is no other way for true worship other, other than when we've received Christ and the Holy Spirit and he enables us to worship and it's all about Jesus. We sang that song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you. When the music fades and all is stripped away, you might think, what's that about? Well, the person who wrote it was a really top worship leader. And what he realised was in their church that they were getting so much wound up with the music and it was what they'd made it instead of worship and the songs. And so they decided for, I think it was four months, they met and didn't sing at all. They just met and prayed and looked at the word. And then this was the first song afterwards, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. Because that's what they did for four months. And then he, I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you. So that's the background to that song. You might think, why is it called when the music fades and all is stripped away? That's the reason. Those who glory in Jesus Christ who boast in Christ. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. And we can say that in our own lives, what we've made it. And I can tell you that a preacher feels that even heavier. I'm sorry for what I've made it, Lord, because it's all about you. Because the false teachers, they were boasting in their own achievements, what they had done. And Paul said, we put no confidence in the flesh. Anything we can try to achieve of ourselves rather than what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And Paul says, this is a danger. And that's why I've called it danger. Take care. Danger, take care. And Paul says, he kind of writes, he, more than anyone, needs to be careful more than anyone, because he has so many reasons, he says, to put his confidence in what he describes as the flesh. And so he writes this list of things. If someone thinks they've got a good reason to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, following the law of Abraham, of the people of Israel. He said, I was a real, I'm a real Jew, I'm the authentic thing of the tribe of Benjamin. But he was the youngest son of Jacob, the tribe of the first king, who was also called Saul. And of course, Paul was also called Saul. 
He, they stayed loyal to David. He said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was able to speak Aramaic. He said, I'm as true a Jew as there could be. In regard to the law, they were putting all their hope in the law, a Pharisee, the strictest one of all the Jews, the strictest sect. They were devoted to the law. And not only, I, I talked about Jesus plus, they were devoted to the law plus because they'd added even smaller details to it. As for zeal, persecuting the church. You can see, if you read in the book of Acts, how he was complicit in the killing of Stephen, how he was out to arrest the Christians. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. That doesn't mean that he never broke the law, but his attitude to it was without blemish. Wow. Is Paul bragging about himself? Is Paul saying, look at me, look how wonderful I am? Not at all. He's not bragging in any way. What he's saying is, if anybody could claim the value of these things, it's me. It's me. Think about all the things that he had put in during his life. Somebody said really wisely, I thought, he could beat them at their own game. But it was the wrong game. He could beat them at their own game, but it was the wrong game. And I would say this morning, are you playing the wrong game? What I mean by that is, where is your hope? Where is your hope? This morning I heard a, a thing on the local radio gets on my nerves sometimes what they talk about on Sunday mornings on local radio. But they were talking about this kind of mindlessness, and, uh, mindfulness, not mindlessness, mindfulness and, uh, and whatever. And some of it is really good and I can get some of it. But then they said, and what we do is all of our worries, we put them all on something that we can see. Something tangible. And I thought, that's not a Christian at all. We put our hope on the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is your hope? Is it on something else? You see, those who are adding this false teaching were holding on to all these things. You need Jesus plus them. Bible reading, prayer, doing good things, speaking kindly to others, helping other people. We were um, on the, in Norfolk last week and we went near the, uh, the Broads and we went to a place called Horsey Wind Pump, if anybody's ever been there. And there's this uh, water uh, that comes by the wind pump and it's quite narrow and uh, there was a family there in their boat and they were trying to turn it round. And they couldn't turn it round. And all it needed was just somebody to give a bit of a pull. So I we said, do you want us to help you? And you would have thought we'd offer to do something amazing for them just because we, all we did was just got hold of the rope and just pulled it and kicked the boat out a bit and it spun around. Doing good things to help others. Denying yourself, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying it was a little story really. Um, denying yourself for Jesus, sacrificing things for him. They're all good things. They're all what we should be doing. But Paul would say, danger, take care. Danger, take care. Make sure this is not what your trust is in. The second point just follows on from that. The second point is safety, no Christ. There's danger, but there is safety in knowing Christ. Paul brings to us a true picture of what they are worth to him. Previously, those, those things that we, he's just been talking about, he would have been so proud to be able to say those things. He had worked so hard for them, but now he has seen them in a new light. That happened on the way to Damascus. The Damascus Road experience when Paul, or Saul as he was at the time, was out to arrest the Christians, take them back. And the Lord Jesus Christ broke into his life 
and shone his light to him on the Damascus road. Max Lucado said, Paul had blood on his hands and diplomas on his wall, all the things we've just talked about, but then came the Damascus road experience. All those things that, as he would describe them as diplomas on his wall, And this is where the bookkeeping does come in. Stay with me. See, we get assets and we get liabilities. Okay? So, Paul says things that were assets to him were things like being circumcised on the third day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and all things like that. And you have to look at it as a kind of scales, because this is what you do with a balance sheet. It's why it's called a balance. So on this side, you've got all your assets. And Paul saw them, they were all his assets at one time. And so they were, they were easily weighed down. Yeah, they were the ones that we got the most of. Okay. But then in verse, chapter 3 and verse 7, he says, Whatever were gains to me, those things, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He said those things that were assets actually are liabilities to me he says and it goes this way his life is full of liabilities he says i consider them rubbish now think of the magnitude of that statement think of what he said all the things that he could have hold on held on to he says they are rubbish he says what was to his profit he now sees as a harmful disadvantage they can't help him in any way. Simple illustration. Imagine a boat. A boat that is loaded with valuable goods. Crossing the sea when a great storm comes up and the boat begins to sink. What must the sailors do? They must throw all the valuable goods overboard. And that happened because we see that in the story of Jonah, don't we? That everything was thrown overboard. See, the goods are valuable, but they are making the boat sink, the weight of them. And the men are about to drown. And what Paul's saying is he's had to throw all his old religious goods, his background, his circumcision, his legalistic righteousness overboard, that he might be saved. And he says, there has been a great transaction there's been a great transaction but we see we're left now with a life of liabilities so we're this way aren't we sometimes the bank manager i don't know if they do it now now would have said i want to see you i don't know if they do that anymore i heard a little story about somebody who got a, uh, a letter from the bank and it said dear sir may i remind you that you are supposed to bank with us and not the other way round. I don't know whether you get messages from the bank. But these are now debits. There was nothing on the credit side. Take care, said Paul. Danger. Is everything loss for Paul? Absolutely not. Because although he considers everything that was to his profit on this side is now a loss on this side he says compared to knowing christ the loss of everything important to him the things we have already seen and more in verse 8 he says what is more i consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish or garbage that I may gain Christ. You see, these were all the liabilities, but Christ was the asset. He's the greatest asset. You're in credit again with Christ. The way to safety is in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no greater thing. There is no more valuable thing. There is no other way. The Amplified Bible says it's a priceless privilege. 
an overwhelming preciousness, surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Jesus. Because that passage, although you might have thought, oh, there's lots of things there about Paul's old life, is all about Jesus. It's Jesus-centred. I consider loss for the sake of Christ, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, that I may gain Christ through faith in Christ. It's Jesus-centred. And Paul says that's what he'd realised. All the things that he'd been trusting in had gone, and now he's jesus centered and it's summed up by knowing christ what does that mean what it does not mean is i know about him i know about jesus you see i know about countless people from politics and sport people in the public eye royalty i don't know them i know a little bit about them I'm always, I've told you before, I'm always amazed at mastermind when they pick a, a, a specialist subject and they pick this random person from 1600 and something and I've never even heard the name of them. And they're asking all these questions and they know everything about them. But they don't know them. They've just got a, a head knowledge of what they've learned. But know in this sense is what might be described as the deepest possible union the closest possible relationship and that's what the lord jesus christ offers to us what did it what did it mean to paul to know christ well it deserves a whole series of sermons not that we've got time to do that this morning firstly for paul it was to be accepted on the basis of righteousness not his own not all the things he'd done not all that great long list but on God's gift to him, on the condition of believing. To be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. No wonder, really, that the passage starts with rejoice in the Lord. Because there are so many things that Paul could have trusted in and rejoiced in and boasted in, but he says, no, rejoice in the Lord. So if you see, he sandwiches it. Rejoice in the Lord, then all the things I could trust in, but no, this is what I rejoice in, which is in the Lord. So he sandwiched it in the middle. In verse 10, he says this, I want to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You see, to know Christ is to live in knowledge of him. I want to know Christ and fellowship with him, being obedient to him, obedient to the law. In John 15, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command. There's the, the um, parable that Jesus told of the two builders. And what did Jesus say? Though the wise man is the one who hears my words and puts them into practice. You see, we are, we've got to be obedient to God, to the words of Christ. And God has works for us to do. I remember somebody saying when I was a very young Christian, you are saved to serve. I wasn't quite sure what he meant, but you are saved to serve. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's handiwork. Isn't that beautiful? We are God's handiwork. If you like anything to do with crafting or woodworking or whatever, you see great, beautiful handiwork. We are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do thirdly it meant sharing christ's sufferings becoming like him in his death how paul suffered for the sake of christ as he wrote this he was in prison there's no time to see how he was flogged how he was beaten with rods almost to death there's no time to look at that but paul himself said we must go through many hardships to enter 
the kingdom of God. See, there must be a willingness to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Jesus said, didn't he? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. All about the suffering. Now, if you're following in a Bible and you've got it open at verse 10, you might think you're talking about all the sufferings, you miss something out. Because this is what we looked at. I want to know Christ, yes, participation in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death. But actually, if you've got uh, the, the words in front of him, uh, of you, and I think this is really important, why I keep suggesting it's good to have the words in front of you, you would see that the full verse is this. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Can you see the, the difference? See, the difference is not just about participation in sufferings it's also about to know the power of his resurrection dying to self marks the death of our old self but the power of christ's resurrection gives us the power to live for him so we've got the assurance of resurrection and note you can't have resurrection without crucifixion just finally and I mean finally. In verse 11, Paul says, So somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, if you are wondering what that means, Paul is, is Paul uncertain whether he will know resurrection? Somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead? I don't think he is. He's not in doubt. Paul is not lacking assurance. The how is what is in question? Will it be death now? Or will it be in the future? Some feel so that it's so awesome that Paul is saying kind of somehow as if it's too good to be true. But it isn't. It's not too good to be true. Knowing Christ means knowing his resurrection. So for this morning, danger, take care. Don't try to come to God through any of your own efforts or achievements, even if it's adding it to Jesus. There is safety in knowing Christ. There's a danger, there's safety. The message says this, I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. Why settle not for second best, but for something that will ultimately have no worth at all by itself? Jim Elliot was an American missionary, Christian missionary, who was killed in Ecuador. And he gave a quote that surely cannot be overused. He said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let's pray to you. Lord God, this is a precious piece of scripture, as all scripture is, but this to, to us this morning is precious. Lord we see there that there is a danger of trying to uh, have confidence in the flesh, in all the things that we've done, in keeping the law and keeping the rules. But Lord, we also see that there is great safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray, Lord, that as we've looked at that this morning, we might be willing to put those things to the past, to know you, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection 
from the dead. Thank you, Lord. We bring this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we draw to a close, we're going to sing the song, All I Once Held Dear, Built My Life Upon. And it's just based upon this scripture. Let's come together and pray. Father, may the words that we have heard this morning reach down into our hearts. May the praise that we have expressed in our worship have come from our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you have been pleased with us today. Take us from this place and use us, we pray, Lord. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.